I'm Aditi Lama with the Tosna edition of South Asian News, Vision of Asia. We are coming to you from our studio in New York City. Welcome to the show. Let's begin the episode taking a look at the coronavirus pandemic and its impact. The world has surpassed 138 million cases of COVID-19 with nearly 3 million deaths. On that, India, home to many of our viewers, reported more than 200,000 new COVID-19 cases for the first time with infections in India surpassing 14 million. Indian cities have gone into curfews and lockdowns to curb the naive wave of COVID-19 in India. Here in the United States, we are at more than 564,000 COVID-19 deaths and more than 31 million cases. This is happening as experts are getting worried about the next surge of coronavirus due to COVID-19 variants, loosening of COVID-19 restrictions and COVID fatigue in many. Even though the vaccination program is speeding up, these experts continue to encourage the three key guidelines of protecting ourselves, especially wearing a mask, even if one is vaccinated. On vaccine, nearly 30% of U.S. adults are now fully vaccinated, so remember to get your vaccine when it's available and visit cdc.gov for more information. Meanwhile, Derek Chauvin's trial continued today with both sides now resting their case. Chauvin chose to invoke the Fifth Amendment and did not testify. The jury will start its deliberation after Monday's closing arguments. Send us your comments on this trial on events at itvgold.com. With that, let's begin tonight's episode. Let's take a look at the headlines. Dr. Lt. Kamal Kalsi on upcoming surge in COVID-19 cases and vaccine, New Jersey. Biden to end America's longest war by pulling troops out. Veteran journalist Rohit Vyas, New Jersey. Pause on Johnson & Johnson's COVID-19 vaccine for 10 days. Dr. Purvi Parikh, New York City. Well, it's time for a short break on Vision of Asia South Asian News segment. We'll be right back. And welcome back. I am Niti Lama and this is Vision of Asia, Thursday night episode of South Asian News. Let's take a look at coronavirus updates and measures. Conversations continue to happen about the rare case of blood clots seen in recently in women who got the Johnson & Johnson single-dose COVID-19 vaccine. The CDC and FDA are now recommending a pause on the use of the vaccine for 7 to 10 days, affecting the current rollout of vaccines in the United States. More than 7 million people have already received the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine and public health officials are emphasizing that for most people, the benefits of getting this vaccine outweighs the risks and that pausing this might do some harm to the vaccination program. On the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 pause and more, we spoke with health expert Dr. Purvi Parikh. Here's what Dr. Parikh had to say. Johnson & Johnson's single-dose vaccine has now been paused and it's been recommended to be paused by the FD and the CDC, and it's being linked to a rare blood clot that, uh, you know, six women in this country had between the ages of 18 and 48. My question to you is, what is this connection between rare blood clots and what are they doing exactly to the body? And how concerned are you about this? Right. You know, um, I'm glad that there is this pause so we can further investigate what is going on. Um, but, you know, I do want to remind people that this is extremely rare. So, yes, while, while it's concerning, um, I wouldn't panic or be fearful of this vaccine because literally it's six out of 6.8 million, you know, so it's literally one in a million cases. So statistically, you're actually more likely to be hit by lightning. You know, uh, it's much more common to get blood clots uh, from being being obese or smoking or being on uh, birth control pills. So there's there's so many other 
factors, you know, but, um, you know, what we're, what the thinking um, theory is, is that it might be the same mechanism in which we saw some rare blood clots with the AstraZeneca vaccine. So both AstraZeneca and Johnson and Johnson use the same type of vaccine, meaning they use um, a vector or an inactivated common cold um, virus to actually bring in the information about coronavirus to your immune system. And that's how it works to mount the immunity. So the thought is, the blood clot might be uh, an immune reaction, like your own body reacting to that vector, because now we're seeing it in both of the vaccines that are a similar uh, technology. But again, I just want to stress that, you know, if you get the real illness, COVID-19, you're very likely to clot. Like one in 20 people in the hospital develop blood clots who have COVID-19 and one in a hundred recovering at home. So that's much more common, you know, than one in a million. So you're still better off getting the vaccine because the benefit is much more than the, the risk, which is luckily very, very rare. So are you saying that the AstraZeneca blood clot and the Johnson & Johnson blood clots is pr uh, pretty much the same? It's really the might body the same? Yeah, so that's what that's what the current thinking diagnosis is. And it makes sense because they're both very similar vaccines. But we'll know for sure uh, once, you know, the FDA and CDC finish their investigation. They announced yesterday that they're going to need another like seven to 10 days to thoroughly look through everything. But that's what it looks like now, initially. And what's the impact of blood clots on a body? What can happen? Yeah, so what blood clots do is basically in your blood vessels, there's inflammation and the clot uh, can be dangerous because it can block your blood vessel so that blood doesn't go through as it's supposed to. And of course, we need blood to bring nutrients, oxygen uh, to various parts of our body. So again, that's why it is concerning for sure. Um, but like I said before, the actual virus COVID-19 causes so much more blood clotting. So many people, almost a third of the people in the ICU develop blood clots when they have COVID-19. And those clots can cause strokes and heart attacks and a lot of devastation. So um, we have to look at the big picture here. What about the people that have gotten the Johnson & Johnson vaccine already? There was already this concern about the efficacy being lower than Pfizer and Moderna. Now with this, um, should they be concerned? What should they watch out for in terms of these rare blood clots? Right. So um, there is no need for concern, uh, especially if you had your vaccine more than three weeks ago and you're feeling fine. Um, these six uh, to seven cases that we've identified all happen within uh, six to 13 days. So fairly soon after the vaccination, it was more common in the, um, the younger women. And, um, you know, if you feel well, there's no need to worry that this could happen to you, because even in the clinical trials and all of the other millions of people are, are fine without any clot. But some warning signs is that you could have like very, very severe headaches or blurred vision. Um, or let's say, you know, sometimes headache is common with the vaccine, right? Because your immune system is responding. Uh, but if the headache is not responding to Advil or uh, Tylenol or those usual medications, then it's, it's getting worse. Th those are all warning signs you should go in and be seen. Um, but otherwise, there's no need to panic and get checked for blood clots because, these, again, these are extremely rare. More on coronavirus updates and measures. More than 30% of U.S. adults have now been vaccinated. The CDC has stated that more than 255 million doses have been delivered and more than 198 doses have been administered in the country. The government is currently vaccinating about 3 million doses per day. Among seniors, about 60% are fully vaccinated and about 80% have received at least one dose. But this is all happening as many parts of the country, such as the state of Michigan, are seeing record high numbers of COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. And experts all across are pleading to all Americans to continue taking health measures to reduce transmission. More on this, we spoke with Dr. Lieutenant Colonel Kamal Kalsi. Here is the conversation. I'm aware that Pfizer and Moderna are both effective against the UK variant. But my question to you is, can we vaccinate people fast enough to reduce the impact of this variant? Or do you think right now with the surge, we're a little too late? So we have the capability. Uh, if you go on, uh, uh, if you go on the, uh, the numbers that the Biden administration has put out, they've, they're vaccinating about 1% of the population roughly uh, each day. Uh, so if you figure that we've got 
somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the population vaccinated you if you can continue to vaccinate one percent of the population per day you know we should hit 70 percent by the end of uh by the end of june uh maybe early july uh that would be uh, that would be quite an accomplishment um and then we could work on figuring out what we're going to do for the fall uh, I, I believe uh, what is uh, likely is that uh, kids will also uh, uh, get the vaccine. They're looking at studies in in, in Europe right now, and, and some smaller studies here in the U.S. Uh, at uh, you know giving kids the vaccines. Uh, and then the other thing that I think likely will happen is there will be some sort of a booster shot, um, you know, that to address the the variants that are that are out there. When do you think we would need to take the booster shot, according to you? It's hard to it's hard to predict. You know, I, I think uh, uh, there's a chance that they may have a booster shot ready by the end of the year, um, but it may be pre that may be a little premature. Uh, so it it depends on how quickly we can get uh, get a uh, get all these vaccinates uh, uh, vaccines mobilized and into the arms of people. Um, and it depends on how, how many variants we have, what are the predominant variants. Right now, uh, I believe there are maybe a dozen different uh, variants, but, but three of them um, are, are the serious ones and the, the ones that, are, that we're really concerned about. And meanwhile, several states across the country have now loosened uh, their COVID-19 restrictions. When you just are looking at these variants, the effectiveness of the vaccine, a possible booster shot, is this wise for these states to open up the way they're opening up? What is your suggestion to them? No, I don't think it's wise as a, wise at all. I mean, I, I, frankly, I think it's quite stupid uh, to be relaxing guidelines right now. Uh, and I understand that you have to balance, uh, you know, economic concerns versus health concerns. But um, public health and safety uh, comes first, you know. And uh, uh, if if you're an elected official and uh, you're putting the public's health in danger. Uh, I, I think you're, you're, you know, you, you should leave that position. You should no longer uh, be a public official. Right. And more questions on vaccine here. Air travel has been uh, something that's become a debate across the country because it's hitting high records during the pandemic, but people are also getting sick across the country. How much is air travel, do you think, contributing to these surging cases? It's hard to say. Um, I know the Army did their own uh, uh, research with regards to planes and uh, 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 vaccine, uh, sorry, the, the transmission of the virus. Uh, and I, I think what they had found was that uh, air travel uh, could be uh, accomplished safely uh, as long as people were masked and uh, as long as uh, uh, people, uh, uh, again, just were very careful, uh, you know, washing hands not touching your face and eyes and all that. Uh, you know, I, I don't know, I think is the, is the true, true answer. You know, I don't know how much of a uh, uh, infectious burden the uh, flying adds to this. Uh, uh, but um, I know that the, uh, uh, you know, large gatherings, um, you know, getting together for uh, you know, in stadiums for large football or soccer or uh, in, in any large enclosed space for uh, for any reason. It definitely is, is a large contributing factor. According to you, what can be done after somebody is vaccinated? What is the safest thing we can do? You know, you want to have a small gathering uh, 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 at your house with family and friends. Uh, you know, I think that that's a safe thing to do. Um, if you want to go to the, if you want to go to the beach, uh, locally and, uh, keep yourself, uh, distanced from people, you know, I think you could do that safely. Uh, and, uh, you know, if, if you have a, uh, if you have a restaurant that, uh, you could do the socially distanced, uh, uh, meal in, uh, with a, you know, with your family or a small group, I think that that's safe. Um, and, uh, I think we'll get more and more information, more and more data about what things are safe. Uh, you know, as uh, as more and more people get infected uh, in this next surge, 
I think we may uh, start to see uh, more and more restrictions. So it's in our best interest to try to control this uh, as quickly as we can. And I, it, it behooves everybody to, to try to uh, get the vaccine if it's uh, available to them. While it's time for the short break on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community will be back shortly. And welcome back. I'm Aditi Lama and this is Vision of Asia, South Asian news segment. In politics, President Joe Biden has formally announced his decision to begin withdrawing U.S. troops from Afghanistan by September 11th, the 20th anniversary of the 9-11 terrorist attacks in New York, Washington, D.C. and Pennsylvania that shook America to its core. The president's decision to remove more than 2,500 troops is an effort to end America's longest war of two decades. These two decades have seen more than 2,000 U.S. military lives lost, tens of thousands wounded, countless Afghan casualties, and more than $2 trillion of taxpayer money spent. So far, this decision has seen bipartisan opposition, which has prompted a split on the Capitol Hill between Democrats and Republicans. On this and the impact of pulling U.S. troops out of Afghanistan, we spoke with ITV Go's senior political commentator, Mr. Rohit Vyas. Here is the conversation. Let's now go into another big news that has uh, been made today. And, you know, it's something that everybody has been looking forward to, but we never thought will happen um, this year or next year. President Biden has announced that he's going to pull troops out of Afghanistan on the 20th anniversary of September 11. My question to you is, is this smart and can this really happen? This is an extremely diff difficult position, uh, uh, you know, difficult decision for any president of the United States. Now, President Trump, his predecessor, made the promise to the Taliban, I mean, during negotiations between Washington and Taliban officials in the presence of Afghan officials um, and other third part, uh, other parties. Um, the decision was made and the Taliban accepted that U.S. troops would fully withdraw by the 1st of May. The, the troops that would remain there would be at a further distance. They would be basically, their mission would be tactical in terms of supporting the regime and uh, sort of being a peacekeeper and helping with uh, reintegration of uh, mainstream Afghan society, et cetera, et cetera. There would be no direct involvement in conflicts or anything like that. What President Biden has done here is treading very lightly uh, realized that an abrupt withdrawal may, may not be the best in the best interest of the United States. And so extended that to September. Whether the Taliban is going to accept that or not remains to be seen. The Taliban could well say no. And the Taliban made it very clear uh, during the negotiations with the Trump administration that everybody must be out by the 1st of May. If not, they would resume their tactics of violence and whatever it takes to get any, as they see it, foreign uh, presence out of Afghanistan. It's gonna be a very, uh, to put it very plainly, a very dicey situation, gonna be a very difficult one for the president uh, going forward. And I'm also a little skeptical about the September 11th date. I don't know if that was a good idea to choose that particular date because knowing the history of the Taliban and extremists in the past, what if they decide to do something extreme uh, on that particular day and just uh, let the whole thing uh, fall apart? So I'm, I'm not too sure if that was a well-advised strategy. Can Afghanistan be stabilized, according to you? It'll take uh, generations to stabilize Afghanistan. And by the way, Afghanistan has had a history through centuries of uh, conflict, of uh, being unstable uh, at times in history, going back to uh, the times of Alexander the Great. Um, you know, uh, those type of rulers coming into Afghanistan, it has been very inhospitable terrain. Uh, it is home to some of the largest tribes in the world. And I mean tribes, I mean ethnics, ethnic tribes in Afghanistan have their own unique uh, systems of governance within their own unique regions. And nobody else uh, is judgment, uh, and nobody else's judgment or rule matters to those tribes and to those ethnic uh, communities. So it's a very, very difficult uh, country and complex country to govern. If anybody comes in there thinking they can, they cannot. The Russians failed, as you know. Uh, the U.S. has been there for far too long. Um, and uh, the point is, it's a strategic location. Uh, it's in the interests of Western allies to keep it stable, uh, 
to ensure there is no uh, terrorism emanating from Afghan soil because it's very, very difficult to control if it begins to emanate and if they develop a stronghold in Afghanistan. Right. But do you think pulling troops out of Afghanistan would threaten the countries that are neighboring Afghanistan? Well, President Biden has asked um, the neighboring countries to take a more active role. He named uh, Russia. He named China. He specifically named, uh, he first named Pakistan. Uh, and then he threw in India as well and said we want them to play a more active role in helping and supporting Afghanistan's development. And that's the key. The key is going to be development because if you develop a place or you can uh, you can give reassurances of development and convince the locals that live in Afghanistan that we'll help you develop your country and there is no resistance, then there is hope. So, uh, you know, pulling out, uh, there was a condition and he has sent a message out very clearly to the rest of the world and the neighbors around there, which you pointed out, um, that you're going to have to take a more active role because we're too far away. The United States doesn't need to be there. We're much too far away, but we have our strategic interests and we're going to act on those interests through our allies. But he had a message there for Russia, for, for China, uh, and that message was progress, not conflict. Right. And the president has said it's time to end America's <laughs> longest war. It's time for American troops to come home. So let's see how that will happen. Another country that's also making news here is Iran. We had talked about the Iran and United States nuclear talks. What more insight could you give us about it? And how concerned are you about these talks that keep on happening between these two countries? Very difficult since the last discussion we had. Um, China directly accused Israel of a strategic attack, uh, a cyber attack on its nuclear uh, main nuclear facility. Um, there has been no comment from Israel. And Israel, of course, is the strongest, one of the strongest allies of the United States. So it's, it's also a very difficult situation in Iran. And President Biden has to deal with that because uh, uh, while, as I explained the last time, while the Trump administration withdrew from the uh, peace deal with Iran, the, the nuclear peace deal and the nuclear arrangement for them to open up their sites to inspections, uh, President Biden has gone back and uh, urged them to rejoin and the United States has rejoined. But negotiating with Iran in the midst of, of uh, mistrust, distrust, of the U.S. administration is going to be a very, very uh, difficult task because uh, they, they are a very proud people. They uh, believe in what they believe in. And uh, to them, uh, their biggest enemy is Israel. And Israel has made uh, absolutely no qualms about saying it internationally that Iran poses the biggest threat to the very survival of Israel. So Israel will act unilaterally if they will and if they have to to protect Israeli interests. So it's a very difficult situation to deal with, but um, we'll see how that uh, you know progresses going forward. What could be a potential outcome of, of these talks? Well, um, as I said, uh, both sides are going to stand their ground. The United States wants will lift sanctions or may lift sanctions only if Iran uh, opens up its nuclear facilities proves to the world that it is not uh, developing a nu nuclear weapon, uh, allows everybody to see it, including Israel, to see it and make sure that there is uh, no, no secret weapon being developed, no nuclear uh, warhead, etc., being developed for delivery to all parts of the world. That is the biggest concern for most of the world, actually. Uh, and, uh, and they're going to have to prove to the world and to the United States in particular, and Israel in even more particular, that they don't have a nuclear weapon ready to launch at any time. So it's, it's again, it's, it's an extremely difficult uh, situation, but um, we'll see. I'm not too sure if this is going to work out or pan out the way the U.S. sees it. Israel says it's not going to work. They were very happy with President Trump's decision to pull out and not negotiate at all with Iran and, in fact, impose tougher sanctions. Uh, we'll see how President Biden uh, moves forward with this. Well, this starts up our show for the night. Please send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations in our show. Email us on events at activegold.com or follow us on Facebook at ITV Gold. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel for watching many of our popular shows. Thank you for joining us tonight from Queens, New York. This is Vision of Asia, and I am Diti Lamba. Take care and be well. Yeah.